when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near Bethage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olive, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go to the village in front of you. When on entering, you will find a colt tied there, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here, and if anyone asks you why you're untying it, you shall say this, The Lord is in need of it. So those who were sent away went and found it, just as he had told them. And when, he, and when they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying it? And they said, The Lord is in need of it. And so they brought it to Jesus, throwing their cloaks on the uh, colt. They sat, they sat Jesus on it, and as he rode along, they spread the cloaks on the road. He sat as, sorry, as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of the Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had been seeing saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if, they were, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day that the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you do not know the time of your visitation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I have the honor of uh, preaching to you this morning out of the Gospel of Luke, Luke 19. So if you haven't turned there with your Bibles, I encourage you to do so now. Um, and also, I've also learned that a combination of peanuts and strawberries for breakfast with a lot of caffeine is not a good combination. So I'm a little anxious, so I ask for your prayers. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we lift up our hearts to you. We entrust ourselves to you. We ask that, that you will good and perfect things for us, that we might see these in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that we might be filled by the Holy Spirit to pursue these things, Lord, to pursue, to pursue your peace. I ask for this peace for this congregation, for this church. I ask it for myself, that this morning we might hear your word and be edified and encouraged to follow after you. Amen. We look to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 I remember a story that I, uh, I heard a few years ago. Uh, it's, a, it's an old story about Sherlock Holmes and uh, Dr. Watson. And uh, one night they decided to go on a camping trip. And after dinner and a bottle of wine, they, they laid down and they went to sleep. And some hours later, uh, Holmes awoke and uh, nudged his friend Watson, and he said, Watson, look up at the sky and tell me what you see. And Watson replied, I see millions upon millions of stars. And Sherlock says, what does that tell you? Watson pondered for a minute, and he said, well, astronomically, it tells me that there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, I observe that the planet Saturn is in the constellation Leo. Horologically, I deduce that the time is approximately a quarter past three. Theologically, I can see that God is all-powerful and that we are small and insignificant. Meteorologically, I suspect that we will have a beautiful day tomorrow. What does it tell you, Holmes? Holmes was silent for a minute and he said, Watson, someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> What's often the most significant and important thing is often overlooked, if not missed altogether, because it doesn't appear, at least at first, to be significant. It's very possible to have a familiarity with and insight into the depths of knowledge about the world, and even to an extent the things of God, and yet totally miss their ultimate significance. Wow. So this week is Holy Week. It's the end of the season of Lent, uh, which is a time 
throughout the history of the church that Christians have been encouraged to humble themselves and reflect uh, upon uh, the cross which looms and as this week in particular uh, progresses from Friday until Sunday it's time for us as individuals but also as a corporate church um, to partake in and reflect particularly on the lowliness and the humility of Christ yeah. as we anticipate the cross but also with hope anticipate the resurrection okay. and so that's where we are and that's where we are in Luke uh, 19 as we start with the triumphal entry, um, to perhaps orient ourselves a bit within the Gospel of Luke, um, Jesus is, of course, at this point, well into his ministry. He's got about a week left until he's crucified and resurrected, and he has garnered a bit of a reputation for himself as the promised Messiah. Now, what kind of Messiah is not exactly evident to the people. Of course, Jesus knows and those with eyes of faith to see him, as we'll, we'll get on to uh, here in a little bit. At this time, there was the expectation that the Messiah would be a descendant of David. Of course, David was a king, and so as uh, logically, if he's a descendant of David, he's going to be a king, he's going to be a conquering ruler. As such, he would be the rightful king to lay claim to the throne of Israel, and to do so throws out not only Herod, who is a vassal king ruling on behalf of the Romans at this time, uh, but also the Romans themselves, who ruled over the Jewish people rather oppressively. One can imagine the surprise of his disciples then, when towards the end of Luke 18, uh, in verses 31 through 34, before Jesus enters Jerusalem, that he says he's going there in order to die. They don't comprehend what he's saying. Rather, they don't understand the significance of his words. The text says that what Jesus tells his disciples is, quote, hidden from them. But on the heels of him telling them this, they're passing by on the, on the road to Jericho, and a blind man is sitting by that road, and he overhears that Jesus and his disciples are passing through, which prompts him to cry out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Note then the title, Son of David. The blind man is recognizing Jesus as king. But again, the question is, what kind of king? As Jesus draws near to the man, he asks what he wants, and the man requests to see. That's all he asks for. And Jesus commends the man, stating that his faith has made him well, or quite literally, his faith has saved him. There's more going on underneath the surface here. It's not just simply that the man has a restoration of eyesight, but it's also a restoration of his entire person of which the healing of his eyesight is only a pointer towards. The blind man understands what kind of king Jesus truly is. Immediately after this incident, at the beginning of uh, chapter 19, there's another issue with sight. There's another man, a chief tax collector named Zacchaeus, who hears of Jesus passing through, and he wishes to, again, see him. So he climbs up into a sycamore tree to do so. Jesus is passing by, he takes note of this, and he looks up and requests to stay at his home. In response to this encounter with Jesus, Zacchaeus declares that he'll give away half of his possessions to the poor, and that anything that he's defrauded people of, he will pay back four times as much. Jesus again declares, similar to the instance with the blind man, that salvation has come to Zacchaeus. And as Jesus puts the matter, he came to seek and save the lost. Again, as with the blind man, the issue here is one of seeing and responding. This, is going to, this has been a theme throughout the Gospel of Luke. If you open up Luke chapter 1, there's, the, uh, there's Jesus' birth, and then there's the angel's proclamation. Of, oh no, this is Luke chapter 2. The, angels, the angel's proclamation to the shepherds, peace on earth and goodwill towards men. And then further on, after Jesus is born, 
There's Simeon, who's in the temple. Uh, Joseph and Mary have brought Jesus to the temple in order to present him to God as was custom according to the Mosaic law. Simeon is overcome by the Spirit. He lifts up baby Jesus, and he says, My eyes have seen your salvation. The issue throughout the Gospel of Luke is one of seeing and responding. It's here in Luke 18 and 19, and it's going to continue to be under the surface as we move towards Jerusalem. However, there are those who do see Jesus, and they don't respond in the same manner as the blind man and Zacchaeus, including, of course, most of the Pharisees, and broadly the Jewish people at, at large. It's worth stating at this point, I'm going to kind of use these titles interchangeably, because as they are the rulers over the people, they often stand in the place of the people, and so the attitude of the Pharisees often reflects the attitude of the Jewish people at large. So if I start going these titles uh, interchangeably, don't get confused, that's just what's going on. And that's how the text talks about it. Many would see Jesus and impose upon him their own preconceived notions of what the Messiah ought to do and what he ought to look like. Thank God nobody does that today. <laughs> Understanding that there are those who are doing this and expecting the kingdom of God to appear immediately and so kick out the Romans, Jesus offers his listeners a parable before he enters Jerusalem in Luke 19, 11 through 27, which is the parable of the 10 minas or coins. It's a longer parable. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, what's important for our purposes here is that Jesus identifies himself with a kingly figure who goes away for a time, which is confusing to the disciples because they're expecting the king not to go away. They're expecting him to stay and in initiate the kingdom in a very tangible military way. So he's a kingly figure, goes away, and so reparts, imparts responsibilities to his servants despite being rejected as a king by many of his subjects whom he was supposed to rule over. When the king returns, he judges the works of his servants as either faithful or unfaithful, and he also executes those. Oh gosh, I did not expect that. Um, <laughs> executes those. I'm just going to do that. Um, I did not know that would do bend. Anyway, um, executes those who reject his kingship and rebel against his reign. This is perhaps a shock, I know it is, a shocking image to many, but believe it or not, it actually perfectly sets us up for understanding the significance of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. So what is Jesus doing when he does finally enter Jerusalem in Luke 19? Foremost, he's declaring his reign of peace. So how does that work? We're going to get to that. He talks about executing his enemies, those who stand over and against him and, and reject his rule. But first and foremost, he, he is declaring his reign of peace as he enters Jerusalem. How is he doing that? Three ways through a donkey, his disciples, and a declaration. I'm so glad those all begin with D. <laughs> so first and foremost, his donkey. The prophet Zechariah, in chapter 9, verse 9, says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. What's significant of the, about this is that during times of war, oftentimes the king would take up arms and get on a horse and go fight their enemies, whomever they might be. Horses were saved for times of war. What's significant about this instance is that donkeys were written as, written as part of a declaration of peace as opposed to horses which were ridden for war. What about the second thing? His disciples. So in verses 38, his disciples are going before Jesus and they're declaring, the king who comes in the name of the Lord is the blessed one. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. This is significant. They're quoting Psalm 118 here. And what they say, or what they tack on to uh, the end, the part of the king who comes in the name of the Lord as the blessed one is from Psalm 118, which is a victory psalm. It's a psalm of David. It's being declared as, as, as a statement of victory. And then what they tack on to the end of it 
is peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Again, this reflects what the angels have already said at the beginning of Luke in chapter 2. Peace on earth and goodwill towards men. And finally, there's his declaration over Jerusalem. I wanted to add to this text, not just simply the triumphal entry, because, but only, but also what Jesus says immediately afterwards, because it's really, we can only understand the true significance of what the triumphal entry is about, and in what way that it is a triumphal entry, if we understand what Jesus has to say immediately afterwards. So, his declaration. Jesus approaches the city, and he weeps over it. And he says, if you knew this day what would bring peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. There's a lot of Old Testament theology which is standing in the background here, which can be difficult for us to pick up as modern readers if we're just approaching the text at a surface level. Of course, he, he's predicting this destruction of Jerusalem and the temple which did occur in 70 AD as a result of the second Jewish revolt. There were two Jewish revolts, one in the 100s BC, and the second one which began in 69 AD, where they began to take up arms against the, uh, the Romans, their rulers. They begin to fight against them, and the Romans bring in the full force of their military might, crushing the revolution, crushing Jerusalem, and totally destroying the temple, and it's been destroyed ever since. What's significant here is that this is, of course, not the first time that this has happened, that the temple has been destroyed and that Jerusalem has been sacked. In the Old Testament, the destruction of the temple often indicated or did indicate that the presence of God was not with his people. And there would be a number of reasons for this. First and foremost, in the Old Testament, it was because of idolatry. The people were turning away to worship other gods, serve other gods, and they were living in their sin. And this is when uh, God is sending the prophets, Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel, uh, well, bless Ezekiel, this was after the fact, but Isaiah, Jeremiah, some of the twelve, and they're beginning to warn the people and prepare the people for the destruction of Israel. And a lot of people don't believe them. And the reason that they don't believe them is because they, if the, the temple is destroyed and if Jerusalem is taken over, then that means, theologically speaking, that the gods of the invading armies have defeated their god. In the ancient world, it wasn't just viewed as two armies going head to head with one another. It was also viewed as their gods going against one another. And so from the perspective of an ancient Israelite, if you're watching Jerusalem, and you get some of this in what Jeremiah says, because he witnesses the fall of Jerusalem, he witnesses the fall of the temple. If, you, if you're looking at this through the eyes of an ancient Israelite, it looks like the Babylonian god Marduk just showed up and ate Yahweh's lunch, which is an unfathomable. But beforehand, God is warning them that it's no, it's not because I'm undergoing a defeat, but it's because you have abandoned me and you have forgotten me, and now I'm going to vacate out of the temple and you're going to be left defenseless. But Yahweh promised to return. He said, my, my, my absent won't, absence won't be permanent. I won't be gone from my people forever. Fast forward 400 years, and Jesus steps on the scene. And he's declaring the kingdom of God. And he is declaring peace. Would you, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that would make for peace. Throughout the gospel up to this point, throughout the gospel of Luke, and really the other gospels do this a lot, they want you to comprehend that the being and doing of Jesus Christ is the being and doing of the God of Israel, Yahweh. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes we don't catch this when we're just jumping into a text and just sort of approaching it at a face value, but everything that's sort of been building up to this point, 
has prepared us for Jesus showing himself to be the God of Israel in flesh among his people coming to them and what is he bringing? Peace. He's trying to make for peace. A people who had rejected him, a people who had forgotten him, who had turned away to other idols and turned away to sin and other gods, he comes now and he is declaring to the people peace. And he doesn't clear out the Romans, which is significant and which would be expected by a Messiah. Rather, immediately after his declaration, he goes to the temple complex. And it says he began to literally throw out those who were selling. And he said, it is written, my house, my house will be a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of thieves. Wow. And every day he was teaching in the temple complex. There's the expectation that Jesus is going to clear out the Romans, but he's less concerned with the Romans than he is with the hearts of his people. He's more concerned with where the uh, Israelites are, where those in, Jerusalem's are, in Jerusalem are. And this is why in Luke 19, verse 41, he ultimately weeps over the city. Because he had left the city. He had left the temple because of rejection. And he comes back, and that rejection is still there. Not because they're worshiping other gods. This is important. Not because they're getting off in, in, in debauchery and idolatry and all these things. That's not the reason. Rather, the pendulum had swung the other way. And they had and wrapped themselves in a self-righteous legalism. And they've developed hardened hearts and hatred towards their neighbor rather than a moving towards them in love. This is why the blind man and Zacchaeus see what Jerusalem and its leaders miss. The blind man and Zacchaeus, as opposed to Jerusalem and their leaders, are aware of their own brokenness. And the Jewish people at large and the Pharisees were not. They couldn't be. Because according to the Old Testament, the prophets were clear. The people are being exiled out of the land, and Jerusalem's being destroyed because of your abandoning of the Torah. This is why the Pharisees became so popular in the couple of hundred years uh, before Jesus steps on the scene. They're a political party, a religious political party. And they came to power because the logic goes, if we're being cast out of the land because of the Mosaic law, we've abandoned it, we've broken it. Therefore, we need a rigid adherence to the Mosaic law. And therefore, we need people to help enforce that. Of course, part of the issue becomes that in their attempts to obey the law and in their attempts to uh, follow the Mosaic law, they became, became incredibly legalistic, incredibly hard-heartened, and they began to reject those for whom the law was given. They reject the blind man and they reject Zacchaeus. And they feel that alienation. In the ancient world, if you're blind, you don't have a lot that you can do for yourself. You can't really get a job. If you don't have a lot of family structure, you're often left on your own, left by the side of the road and begging. That's why he was likely sitting by the side of the road. There's a crowd coming through, and he's going to beg. And as far as Zacchaeus is concerned, he's just a puppet of the Roman government. Who's he collecting taxes for? Rome. And so he's viewed as a compromiser and a traitor against the Jewish people. They both have experienced a lot of suffering and a lot of rejection. They are very aware of what kind of people they are. They're very aware of their brokenness. And so when they hear that Jesus is coming by and they see him and his proclamation of the kingdom of God and his proclamation of peace, they are able to see him for he truly is and they love him for it. I would encourage you not to view the blind man and Zacchaeus here as not only fortunate individuals who happen to come face to face with, the, with, with Christ, 
Rather, I would encourage you to view them as models of faithful obedience. And that's part of the irony. It's not that the Pharisees are themselves models of faithful obedience, but rather it's, it's the poor, the blind, the broken, and the compromiser who see Jesus and love him for it. As individuals, they're aware of their brokenness, and yet they embrace healing in their stories in the person of Christ. This necessitates their following after Jesus and the same peace which he offers. I tend to find that often those of us within, not, well, I don't want to say those with us within the evangelical church or just Americans because we typically do this as, as people. We like, to, we like to distance ourselves from the peace and the suffering which Jesus offers. Oftentimes, the, the models that the Bible holds forth, partic particularly uh, in the Gospels, and then Paul also does this a lot, is he holds forth Christ as an example, and he for holds forth his, the peace that he offers, he holds forth the humility that he, go, uh, that he embraces, holds forth the, uh, the suffering that he endures, and he says, if Jesus underwent this, so too must we. And the question which is overhanging for us as Christians as Jesus is entering Jerusalem is will we follow the way of the Messiah in the declaration of his reign of peace? Are we going to accept his peaceful reign? Many of us would say, of course, but what the text wants us to see is that wanting a peaceful Messiah is not as intuitive as we might first believe. We might say, of course, we want a peaceful Messiah. Of course, we love peace, or at least a kind of peace that, that suits us. But I want to examine how the Pharisees' response to Jesus, to Jesus' offer of peace, reflects the many ways we reject his peace as well. It's easy to condemn the Pharisees, but it's much harder to honestly reckon with how we reflect them. I think for many of us, Growing up in, in the American South, we're sort of inundated with uh, Christian morality and Christian teaching from a very early age. And so the temptation there becomes that we uh, in sort of indulge ourselves in being able to put forth a good mask and saying how much we are adhering to the Christian rules or the Christian culture that we found ourselves in. Oftentimes, this leads us to, much like the Pharisees, to reject the idea of their own brokenness wow. and to reject the idea that they need healing. As contrary to the blind man and Zacchaeus who are well aware of their own suffering and brokenness. So how do the people respond to Jesus' reign of peace? Their response is encapsulated by the Pharisees' response to Jesus' disciples in verse 39. Jesus, rebuke your disciples. The disciples are coming in, declaring peace in heaven, glory in the highest heaven. Jesus is coming in, preaching the kingdom of God, his reign of peace, and the Pharisees, likely out of a fear of Roman punishment, because they're not necessarily missing the messianic connotation here, they reject the disciples and thereby Jesus' Jesus's declaration of peace. So why do the Pharisees and the Jewish people reject Jesus' offer of a peaceful way? And how might their rejection of peace expose our own tendency to forget peace? Discerning here how the people miss Jesus will help us discern how we are prone to do the same. I think they primarily do it uh, for, for two reasons. One, they don't like the peace which Jesus offers. And two, they don't like who Jesus offers his peace to. I'm going to unpack these for the rest of the remainder of our time. One, the people want a Messiah who will achieve for them what they want, namely the judgment and condemnation of their enemies. The irony is that their desires which lead them to reject Jesus as Messiah will lead to their own condemnation and punishment. This is why Jesus, right before he enters Jerusalem, that he gives a parable which ends with the execution of his enemies. These aren't necessarily neutral 
people, otherwise reasonable people. These are people who, when understood in the context of the triumphal entry, are actively fighting and resisting peace. Again, as I've said, in the Jewish revolt in 70 AD, as in the Jewish revolt, there's an unavoidable political element to the Jews' rejection of Jesus here. Jesus, of course, throughout his teachings is, is emphasizing um, this path of submissiveness, humility, lowliness, which is extended even towards one's enemies. Throughout the gospel, the people grumble as they do with Zacchaeus. Like it says in verse 7, all who saw that Jesus went to lodge with him began to complain. He's gone to lodge with a sinful man. They're rejecting this idea, particularly the Pharisees, also the Jewish people at large. They're rejecting this idea that the kingdom of God is mainly there for the broken. They're rejecting this idea that the kingdom of God is there for sinners. There's an unavoidable political element to it insofar as this is also extended towards Romans. Jesus says in his Sermon on the Mount that if a Roman soldier asks you to carry his equipment for a mile, you take it for two miles. Jesus isn't exactly, he's not exactly friendly with the Romans, but he's not openly antagonistic in the way that the Jewish people would prefer. But rather he's offering them the way of peace, and it'll often be like it is at the crucifixion, when it's a Roman soldier, like in the Gospel of Mark, who beholds Jesus crucified and says, truly, this is the Son of God. They will not leave, Jesus says, they will not leave one stone upon the other. This is a, this is a reference, of course, ultimately to the destruction of Jerusalem. In their rejection of peace, they bring upon themselves violence and war. <laughs> And the ir irony is that the peace that they reject is only going to bring upon them more suffering. Violence has a tendency to beget more violence. And in both cases where Jesus says in verses 40, I tell you, if they were to keep silent, the stones would cry out. And verse 44, they will not leave one stone upon the other. In both cases, the stones here are serving as a testimony. Like how the Old Testament figures such as Abraham or Moses would set up stones to serve as a remembrance of what has happened, so too is the stone imagery being employed here in one case to offer a testimony for a peace declared to the people, and in the other case to offer a condemnation for a peace rejected. But ultimately, this is why Jesus can on the one hand pronounce the judgment and defeat of his enemies, and yet declare peace on the other hand. Those in Christ's view, when he speaks of judgment, are those who are dead set against the way of peace. Those who are partic uh, participating in the violence of the world, even for, quote, just justified reasons, often end up only further perpetuating that cycle of violence and hatred, and the innocent offer su often suffer as a result. This is what Christ is speaking of when he speaks judgment against his enemies. Jesus' declaration here is a warning for us who might reject that way of peace. This peace is the work of God, encapsulated in Jesus Christ, and judgment comes against those who reject this peace God offers and, then choose, and instead choose to continue to follow after destruction and chaos. It's worth stating that what Christ really means by peace here is not simply a kind of tranquil peace of mind. I'm sure you've probably picked that up already. I know, I'm, I'm mostly done with my sermon. I haven't even defined peace yet. <laughs> when the Bible speaks of God's people having peace, this isn't simply a tranquil peace of mind. Like we're some sort of tranquil state of mind which merely allows us to endure hardship or that it's just the, the absence of violence or suffering. Rather, what's in view here, especially where Jesus' ministry is involved, is what the Old Testament calls shalom, often translated as peace. And this is correct, but it's incomplete. Perhaps a more accurate idea of the biblical conception of peace is related to the idea of wholeness or completeness. Without getting off on too much of a rabbit trail, the Old Testament law, whenever there was a loss of blood from a person, that, deemed, that person was deemed unfit to enter, enter the temple itself where the presence of God dwelled. His holiness required separation between himself and the people if there was any defect in them, not only morally but also physically. 
We see this, for example, in Mark chapter 5, where there's a hemorrhaging woman, and she's undergoing a loss of blood for her entire life. And yet, where Jesus meets her and heals her, he brings to her shalom. He heals her, her physical defect, but he, bring, he brings her to a state of wholeness. This is the kind of peace which Jesus is talking about, and this is the peace that the Pharisees ultimately reject. And this way, judgment that Jesus talks about here is not the antithesis of peace. Rather, judgment, particularly final judgment, will be used to restore creation back to its proper state. Again, the stones themselves would cry out. But first, judgment will be turned towards Jesus himself, the blessed one who became the cursed one, so that we might be reconciled to God and have peace and restoration, reconciliation to him as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5. See then that Jesus' reign of peace brings, see what it brings in light of what we've already seen from the blind man and Zacchaeus. They don't simply achieve a tranquil state of mind. They're restored to proper communion with the living God, Jesus Christ himself. They, even these deplorables and undesirables, are brought to a state of wholeness. And this leads to the second reason why the people reject Jesus' peace. The people don't want a Jesus who brings peace to tax collectors and of whom the blind cry out, have mercy on me. Their rejection by the people placed the blind man and Zacchaeus in a position where their desire for restoration and peace is deepened so that when Jesus appears, they're able to see them, see him as he truly is. Again, they lean into their brokenness and they embrace healing in the form of Christ. Their suffering prepared them to be restored to God. And suffering also makes us long for this restoration and peace. It's often easy to leave behind this peaceful way of the Messiah when it becomes a hindrance. And it's very easy to want a peaceful Jesus until we're wronged. Jesus doesn't leave us alone in our desires. He doesn't leave us alone to parse this out on our own, to try to a white knuckle a peace and an acceptance of others but rather as we look to him what he says in john 14 27 is fulfilled peace i leave with you my peace i give to you not as the world gives do i give to you so let not your heart be troubled neither let it be afraid and as we look to christ and follow in his way together we will not be afraid and as paul says in colossians 3 the peace of the Messiah will rule in our hearts. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we look to you and we ask for your mercy for where we have rejected your peace, where we've rejected restoration in your wholeness. God, we patiently wait for you. We ask for, by the Holy Spirit, that you would influence our hearts and minds to look to Christ and so dare to follow after him, not to trust in ourselves, not to harden our hearts as many of the Pharisees did. Christ, let us bring, let us lean into our hope, our, to our brokenness and desire the healing and the peace that you bring. As we look to Friday and as we look to Sunday, let us take the lowly path. We love you, Lord, for yours is the only way. Amen.